a Harvard math professor by the name of Tom Lear. I don't believe he's even alive anymore. But in the 1960s, he used to write these really funny songs about the situation in the world. And he had a song called National Brotherhood Week, which had a verse that went like this. Oh, the Protestants hate the Catholics, and the Catholics hate the Protestants, and the Hindus hate the Muslims, and everybody hates the Jews, but during... And everyone's laughing, especially the Jews, but it's not funny. And the question is why? And again, the why is not just a philosophical question. If you follow the Anti-Defamation League website and you look at the statistics, anti-Semitism is spiking in ways we haven't seen since the Holocaust. It's at the highest levels we've seen in 70 years. So we need to get to the bottom of this phenomenon to ensure that what happened to the Jewish people in Europe between 1939 and 1945 never happens to us or our children or our children's children. Now, if you ask the experts, the historians, why Jews have been hated throughout history, they generally give you one of the following explanations. These are the seven, I would say, classic explanations for anti-Semitism. Number one, economics. We hate the Jews because they just have too much money and power. Number two is chosen people. Those Jews think they're special or better, this superiority thing they got going, this elitism. Number three is scapegoat. We're always in the right place at the wrong time. Blame the Jews for your problems. Number four is Zionism which is the one that's most prevalent today. And it's not so much Zionism, but what that Zionist, horrible, apartheid state Israel is doing to the poor Palestinians with the occupation and the checkpoints and the targeted killings and you name it. Number five is outsiders, that we're, a, we're different, we're a fifth column. You guys know what a fifth column is? A minority you cannot trust. These Jews are never loyal. Number six is deicide, the Christian accusation of Christ killer, that we killed God. And number seven was the one, of course, used by the Nazis, race. We're a different and obviously inferior race. You guys come across this before? Pretty much any supposed explanation for anti-Semitism will fall into one of these seven categories. So with that in mind, let's go back to the beginning. And beginning with economic theory, we're going to go through each of these. And we're going to look at them through the lens of history and fact. We're going to knock off what's not true, and in the end, we'll be left with what is the true cause of anti-Semitism. So economic theory. We hate the Jews because of their money and their power. Where does this first begin? Where's the association of Jews and money? Anyone know where it first starts? Sorry? Sorry? Karl Marx. Karl Marx, way before Karl Marx. Lending money, exactly. Now here we have, here we have, these are some Renaissance period wood carvings. Pictures, now you notice in the images here, these are images of Jews. By the way, medieval Europe Jews did not have the Jewish star thing. They had the circle, which is not a bagel, but a coin. Notice the guy on the left, look at his feet. That's the devil. In medieval Europe, the Renaissance, the Jew and the devil are the same person. Someone's got to lend money. So since the Jew's already going to hell, we'll force him to lend money. Now how do we know it's not the money lending that caused the Jews to be hated? First of all, most Jews didn't lend money. And other, Jew, other people who lent money, by the time they get to the Renaissance, the Lombard bankers of Italy are lending money at significantly higher rates than the Jewish people are lending money. No one's attacking them for that at all. But the real association of Jews and money lending takes off much more recently with the publication of the world's most famous forgery, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You guys heard of this book? It was, written by the, it was written by the secret police of the Tsar of Russia in 1901. They were called the Black 100s. Pretty scary name for a police force. And it's supposedly the minutes of a secret meeting that takes place once every 100 years where the rabbis get together to plot the next 100 years of Jewish control of the world. Now, how do we know it's a forgery besides we know it's a forgery? Anyone who thinks 10 rabbis in a room could agree on anything knows nothing about the Jewish people. But you guys know that after the Bible, there are probably more editions of this book in print than almost any other book on the planet Earth. It's even a bestseller in countries that don't have any Jews, like Japan. I have a friend who actually grew up, an Iraqi Jewish friend, who grew up in Kobe, Japan. And he told me the Japanese buy this book like crazy, not because they're anti-Semitic, they're not, but because they believe it's true and they want to know how the Jews are doing it so they can copy it. <laughs> but how do we know it's not true? Well, first of all, in 1939, a month before the start of World War II, they made a movie out of this story called The Voyage of the Damned. Hitler took a boat called the St. Louis, loaded a thousand Jews on it. Now let's say Jews control the world. How hard would it be for a boat full of billionaire people who control the world to find a port of refuge? Snap your fingers, the doors open. You know what happened to the ship? Anyone know the story? 
It sails around, mostly trying to America, Cuba. For months, no one took any of the people in the Western Hemisphere. They went back to Europe. They were reabsorbed into European countries, and many of them died in the Holocaust. But more than that, today Jews in America are the highest income earning bracket. But Jewish wealth is overwhelmingly a post-World War II phenomenon. If you look at your own families, go back three, four generations, few if any of us had families that had any money at all. I mean, the Rothschilds are the exception. But more than that, you guys heard of the Nuremberg Laws? 1935, two years after getting to power, but four years before the start of World War II, Hitler passes the Nuremberg Laws, which rob the Jewish people of their citizenship and neutralize any political or economic power they have. Their bank accounts, their businesses, their right to hold public office to vote, gone. So if the threat the Jews pose is economic and political and it can be neutralized with legislation, why does Hitler have to go kill the Jews? Obviously in his mind, and we'll see this in a few minutes, the threat they pose is something very different. So obviously the whole economic idea is simply not based in reality and therefore an excuse. Let's go on to number two, chosen people. We hate the Jews because they think they're special. Now, by the way, it is true that we Jews, we don't believe we're necessarily better. For sure not. That's not a Jewish thing. But we do believe throughout history we have a unique mission in the world. Our job is to be a light to nations, to teach the world values, to lead by example. Maybe that could engender, that elitist responsibility thing could engender a certain level of, uh, of hostility focused on us from the non-Jewish world. But if you look at modern Jewish history, with the emancipation of the Jews in a place like Germany, starting in the 19th century, with the birth of the reform movement, which, by the way, began in Hamburg in 1811, as a way of creating a version of Judaism that would allow Jews to be comfortable living amongst German society, basically to assimilate slowly, one of the first things the reform movement dropped was any mention of chosenness or specialness. As a matter of fact, they dropped Hebrew from the prayers, any mention of Israel or Jerusalem. We're not going back to Israel. We're not rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. Germany is our Israel, and Berlin or Hamburg or Frankfurt, that's our Jerusalem. So here you have a community of Jews saying, we're not chosen or special. Our destiny is to merge with the German people. Does the anti-Semitism go away? It goes to sleep for a few years and then comes back more, more powerfully than any other time in history in the form of the Holocaust. But more than that, guys, everyone in the world thinks they're chosen or special. The red sun is in the center of the flag of Japan because they've, they view themselves as being closest to the rising sun, the gods over the Pacific. The word for China in Chinese means center of the universe. By the way, traditionally, the word for non-Chinese is monkey or barbarian. You're not really human if you're not Chinese. Both Christianity and Islam practice what's called supersessionism, which is what? God chose the Jews, rejected them, and chose us instead. So come on. Every people, every religion thinks they're chosen or special and only we're hated for it. And even when we drop the notion, like the reform movement did in Germany a hundred years ago, the hatred doesn't go away. If you get rid of the supposed cause, but the symptoms are still there, then this must not be the cause. It's just another excuse. Scapegoat. Where does scapegoat come from, by the way? Anyone know? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Exactly. Sa'ir le azazel. One of the, in, the, in the time the temple stood in Jerusalem, the high priest would take a goat, symbolically confess the sins of the Jewish people on this goat, which would be sent out to the Judean desert and sent off a cliff. It's a very symbolic act, but this goat didn't do anything wrong. So that notion of scapegoating, this is the one that's true, by the way. We are always scapegoated. But scapegoat, by definition, is always an excuse. It's taking someone who's innocent and blaming them for something that they didn't do. Why do you do that? to divert attention from who's really guilty, exactly. This one is 100% true. We are always the blameless scapegoat for other people's problems, but it's always an excuse. Now, there's something else about scapegoating we have to look at. Here's Hitler speaking at a rally in 1935. Even if you don't speak a word of German, you just watch this man speak, he knew how to get a crowd going. What's the crowd's reaction when Hitler is ranting about how dangerous the Jew is to Germany and the world? How are they reacting? They're cheering. This is great. Imagine he stands up there and says, we must fight against the enemy of the Reich, the midgets. The midgets are our misfortune. By the way, up above, the banner above the rally is the, is the byline of Der Sturmer, the Nazi newspaper, which is the Jews are our misfortune. It appeared on every single issue of the newspaper on the front page. Like the New York Times has all the news that's fit to print. 
Every day under Stummer, the Jews are our misfortune. But when he says midgets, what's the crowd's reaction? Hitler is, as my English wife would say, barking mad. When they hear midgets, they think he needs a uniform with sleeves to tie around the back in an office with no door handle and padded walls. When they hear Jews, they cheer. Do Jews make that much more sense than midgets? Why is it that they think Jews, is, is a, the Jews are a danger and the midgets are not? And the answer is not that really Jews make more sense, but the answer is when you're scapegoating someone, you can't just pick anyone out of a hat. You need to pick someone that people already love to hate. And what's Hitler really building on? So this one for sure is an excuse, but what he's building on is the next one, which is thousands of years of the most violent anti-Semitism, which is Christian anti-Semitism, which is centered around many different accusations, but the primary one is, of course, this one, deicide, Christ killer. I have to say this is my personal favorite. I'm being sarcastic. Just a little, per, a little anecdote. When I, we were little, my grandparents actually bought a number of buildings about 100 years ago in Brooklyn. And we still have one of them in Park Slope. Nice piece of real estate. When we were younger, we were little, we lived there rent-free in grandma's apartment building. At the time, now Park Slope is very gentrified and nice. At the time, we were the only Jews living in an all Irish and Italian Catholic neighborhood. Everyone went to St. Saviors but us. And I still remember when Joseph Viglia, who I used to play with all the time, we played in his house, it was unbelievable. My, my older brother and I, when it was time to eat dinner, his mother would say, send the Christ killers home, you have to have dinner now. But I still remember when we were the only kids, my brother and I, not invited to his first grade birthday party because we killed his God. Remember we knocked on the door and everyone's there and everyone on the street is in the party except he opens the door, he's looking out and he sees my brother and I, he goes, why didn't you invite us? He said, well, we ran out of invitations. So my brother's a smart guy, he's a doctor now. He goes, yeah, right. And then he throws the door open, and this is on the other side of the door, this big gold cross thing. He goes, you killed my God, and he slams the door in our face. And I'm like, <laughs> I was so traumatized. Not only that, it made no sense. At, at seven years old, like, there was Superman. That was the closest thing I could think of to God, and it took kryptonite. Could never figure out how you could kill someone's God with two boards and three nails. But there's so many aspects of Christ killer that just don't make sense. First of all, when is Jesus born and when does he die, according to most opinions? Around the year 1 to the year 34, let's say. When should the Christian world be most angry at the Jews? Right after the event or, you know, or like a thousand years later? Like American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, remember? Who won? My friends in the South say the South's going to do it again. But who won? The North. When's the South most angry at the North? 1866 or 2014? 1866. Imagine you land in Florida this winter, there's the sign. Welcome to Florida, northerners not welcome. You know that expression, time dulls all pain? When should the Christian world be most angry at the Jews? As soon after the event as Christianity becomes a major world religion, now we'll pay the Christ killers back. When does the accusation of Christ killer first appear? A thousand years after the event at the time of the first crusade. Bizarre. But more than that, think about it. Theologically, I don't know how much you know about Christianity, but Christianity does not believe in tshuva. There's no repentance. You're born in sin, you die in sin. And, if you're, and what's the only thing it saves you from, as my friends in Alabama would say, getting that big barbecue in hell, is Jesus died for your sins. That's what the whole thing. He is the one sacrifice. He is the kapara, so to speak, to, as we say. So if he hadn't died, what would have happened? We'd all be burning in hell. So maybe they should be thanking us for doing it if we did it in the first place. But not only that, if you look in the gospel, which is hardly a pro-Jewish book, you look in, you know, you look in Matthew and, and, uh, and John and Mark, overwhelmingly it's the Romans, the Romans, the Romans. They arrest Jesus, they try him, they flog him, they crucify him. So let's split the blame 50-50, some Jews involved in the plot, uh-uh. We get all the blame and they get the church named after them, the Roman Catholic Church. But more than that, the Pope, you know the guy who wears the kippah, but he's not Jewish in Rome? Actually, the current Pope is a very good guy. We're getting a couple good Popes. Benedict I didn't like so much, but this guy is a good guy. But, you know, the Pope is infallible. Only my mother and God have that status. Like, can't be wrong. In 1965, in the most significant statement ever, in 2,000 years, Vatican II, the Pope said, no Jew alive today can be held accountable for Jesus' death. And only a few Jews alive in his lifetime had anything to do with it which means today we're free of all the blame. So when the Pope forgives us for doing something, it had to be done, which we didn't do in the first place to save the world anyway, does anything change? No, it's all excuses. 
And by the way, when you look at Christian anti-Semitism, the excuses are absolutely mind-blowing. What's unique about, about kosher meat, besides that there's certain animals you can eat and you have to shech the animal, you cannot consume any blood. So what are Jews accused of starting in 1144 in Norwich, England? A breaking in, of, of kidnapping a Christian child. You're going to see a great image now. Ritually slaughtering the child. Where's, there it is. Here's the best image. You can see, by the way, all of these classic images of Jews having to wear these stupid hats with their funny names, with the little circles on them. There's a poor Christian child. They're making incisions in his body. The blood is draining into a pan. Why do Jews need Christian babies' blood? Don't answer yet. It's a multiple choice question, which, by the way, in Israel is called an American test. Mivchan Amerikai. A, it's the chief ingredient in matzah. B, Jew, B, all Jews as a punishment for killing Jesus suffer from hemorrhoids. And the only known cure for hemorrhoids in medieval Europe is drinking Christian babies' blood. C, all Jewish men menstruate and need a monthly blood transfusion. D, Jewish boys, when they're circumcised, lose so much blood they have to drink Christian babies' blood to replenish the loss. What's the correct answer? E, all of the above. E, all of the above. And by the way, the Talmud says, you know, what you see in other people is what you really dislike in yourself. Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, said the same thing. It's called transference. It's a great point before we get to Rosh Hashanah. You always have a magnifying glass for your faults in other people. What's the central ritual in a Roman Catholic mass? Transubstantiation. The priest changes the wine and the wafer into the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, by the way, in the, thir in the, in the, in the 13th century, the Lateran Council in 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council said, when it's no longer a symbolic ritual, it's real. When you drink that blood, when you eat that wafer, you're drinking Christ's blood and eating his body. You're really doing it. So what are Jews accused of? Starting in the 13th century in Baylitz in Switzerland, they're accused of breaking into churches, stealing the communion wafers, which are used in mass, which are called the host, okay? Torch bringing them back to their synagogues, torturing them to reenact the death of Jesus. We hate the Jews because they torture crackers. Now we'd laugh at that, except the entire Jewish community of Baalit, several thousand Jews, were all burned alive based on the accusation extracted through torture that they'd stolen a cracker from a church. 14th century Black Death. You remember Ring a Ring a Rosie? Ashes, ashes. Even though thousands of Jews died in a plague that killed up to half the population of Europe, and even though the Pope this time said the Jews are not responsible, there was massive violence directed against Jews because they must have gotten poisoned from the devil to poison the wells in the air of Europe. What's the most non-kosher animal you could think of? The pig. So what's the animal always associated with the Jews? The pig. This is an image that appears over and over again in European art in the medieval and Renaissance period. The next image you're going to see is Martin Luther's church. It's actually a sculpture. This one, which is the most graphic, appears, this is on the bridge in Frankfurt, Germany, outside the ghetto, that thousands of people are probably seeing a day for a very long period of time. Notice everyone is a Jew, including the devil. They all have the Jew sign. Notice the big fat pig. This image is always called Judensal, Jewish pig, female pig. Notice that one Jew is under the pig and the pig is nursing from the, the Jew is nursing from the pig. And notice that the pig is defecating into a Jew's mouth and the Jew's eating it. When Hitler stands up hundreds of years later and says the Jews are subhuman devils and have to be you know, exterminated, he's building on all of this incredible superstitious excuses that have no basis in reality. Obviously, none of this is true. Okay, Jews are outsiders. Now, the major reason we don't like people in this world, I'm not talking about anti-Semitism in general, is what? Dislike of the unlike. I'm white, you're black, you're different. And we Jews, by the way, for most of our history, chose to look, dress, eat, and act differently, and we're also forced to do that. So one would imagine that our very bizarre appearance and different lifestyle and customs and dietary laws and day of worship would have engendered a certain level of hostility. But then again, we get to the 19th century. Who's the big champion of Jewish emancipation in Europe in the 19th century? Anyone know? Napoleon Bonaparte. He was the one who was most strongly advocated. He broke down the walls of the ghettos of Europe. Remember, after the French Revolution, 1794, France was the first country in Europe to give Jews citizenship. They could serve in the army. So he even sends, Napoleon even sends his emissary, Count Stanislaw de clermont tonnerre to the Jews of France. He says, to the Jews as individuals, everything. To the Jews as a people, nothing. 
If you want to keep your separateness, your, your subcategory Jewishness amongst us, don't expect anything. But as individuals, you want to be loyal Frenchmen, go for it. We offer you the, the opportunity. He even convenes in 1806 an assembly of Jewish notables, and in 1807 a great Sanhedrin. He gets 100 rabbis together from all over, basically, mostly Italy and, and, and France, and asks him a series of questions about Jewish loyalty. Can you Jews be loyal to French law? By the way, the very difficult questions for the rabbis to answer. They did a great job of saying nothing. They totally danced around the issues, but it worked. And within, by the end of the 19th century, finally, for the first time in centuries, all Jews finally, whenever they lived in Europe, achieved emancipation in Western Europe. And everything seemed to be going great. And as a matter of fact, what happened to Jewish identity when the walls of the ghettos came down? What did Jews run to do? Assimilate, massive assimilation in Western Europe. If you'd asked the sociologist in 1850, what's going to be with anti-Semitism in 1950, what would they probably have told you? There's not going to be any anti-Semitism in 1950 because there's not going to be any Jews left. They're just going to be gone. They're going to be loved to death by the non-Jewish neighbors. But then we have a little glitch on the radar screen, the Dreyfus trial. You guys heard of the Dreyfus trial? Okay, 1894. It's the most famous trial in probably 19th century European history. Here you have Alfred Dreyfus on the right, who is a totally assimilated 34-year-old captain Jew in the French army, the first Jew in the French officer corps, highest ranking. He was a completely assimilated Jew and a totally loyal Frenchman. France was seemingly enlightened and open, but was still deeply anti-Semitic. The government, the army, Dreyfus was framed as a spy. He was innocent. He was found guilty using forged evidence his defense attorney wasn't even allowed to see. Here he's being publicly humiliated. And he was sent to Devil's Island off the coast of Guiana, which is north of Brazil today. And he actually was tried three times, brought back, and eventually pardoned and reinstated. I can't believe he stayed in the French army. But, but watching this trial is a 34-year-old Hungarian Jew living in Vienna as a journalist whose name is Theodor Herzl. And this is one of his epiphany moments. You know, the clouds open up because the crowd is screaming, not death to Dreyfus the traitor. They're screaming, amort le juif. Kill the Jews. And Herzl writes in his diary, where is it happening? In France, a hundred years after the French Revolution and the emancipation of Jews in the most enlightened country in Europe, he comes to an amazing conclusion. The Jew can change himself into any like, form you want. Like, you, like, you hate me because I'm different. I'll become just like you. Does the anti-Semitism go away? No, it just changes its excuse and comes back from a different angle. Now it's the assimilated Jew who's disloyal. And for him, he doesn't found the Zionist movement. Everyone always thinks hurt. But he joins the movement and pushes it. He gives, he gives it a tremendous boost. Believing, as all early Zionist thinkers did, that the main reason for anti-Semitism is what? We're a non-normal nation. Every other nation has a flag, a passport, an army, and a port of refuge. There's no one to defend us or protect us and nowhere to go. When we have those things, a Jewish state, anti-Semitism will cease. Sadly, Herzl died in 1904. And not only has anti-Semitism not gone away, Israel has proven to be the number one excuse for what? Hating Jews today. And of course, it's not Israel specifically. It's Israel's legitimacy or illegitimacy as a foreign occupying state. And of course, we know this is not true. I'm not going to do a class. I do a lot of speaking on Israel advocacy on campus. But we know that Israel was under attack before it occupied anyone's territory. The UN voted November 29th, 1947, to partition this land into Jewish and Arab states. Had the Arabs accepted it, what would have been born along with Israel in 1948? An Arab state, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. But since that time, they tried in 48. Israel declares itself a state. Five Arab armies declare war and invade. In the end, by the way, we see what happened. Jordan illegally grabs Judea and Samaria. They call it the West Bank. And Egypt illegally, according to international law, takes the Gaza Strip. If the occupation is the root of the problem, then why are we being attacked before there's even a state? And why from 48 to 67 we didn't occupy that territory? It's only after the 67 war when they tried to destroy us yet again, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol offered the Arabs, we will pull back from all the territory, just make peace. Remember the famous reaction of the Arab League? Two months later, no peace with Israel, no negotiation, no recognition. And that's what happened in 2003 and 2008, and you name it, over and over and over again. The point is we're not doing a class on the Middle East, but guys, it's never been about creating a Jewish, creating a Palestinian state. They've said no to that over and over again. It's been about the Arab world's inability to recognize a Jewish state of any size.
But the notion that Israel's occupation or it's what Israel's doing is the root of the problem is clearly just another excuse. So last but not least, we have racial theory. And this is made famous, of course, by Adolf Hitler. He did not originate racial thinking. Racial thinking originated with a, a relative of Darwin. It started in America as the eugenics movement, fantastically interesting topic we don't have time to go into, which was exported to Germany primarily by people like the Carnegie Institute and Henry Ford. But anyway, after evolutionary theory came out, there's an idea of breeding a pure race, which started out as a nice idea and got perverted into, you know, breeding people who are healthy and getting rid of genetic problems into actually breeding people out of the race through murder and breeding a pure race. And the Germans took this to the extreme, of course. You know, Germans also executed handicapped Germans. Mentally handicapped Germans were killed by the thousands. Um, America only forcibly sterilized them, by the way. California forcibly sterilized thousands of mentally retarded people in the early part of the 20th century, not our topic. But Hitler and his racial thinking, they took the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin, and they merged it into the pseudoscience of racial thinking. And in the German warped mentality, of course, just as certain species of animals rose to the top, certain species of homo sapiens. At the top of the evolutionary the mountain is whom in German thinking, Nazi thinking? The Aryans, which has, by the way, a term that has nothing to do with Europe. It actually comes from Iran and India. <laughs> but northern blonde-haired, blue-eyed. That's the ultimate evolutionary form of a homo sapiens. Sapien, then you have Western Europeans and Eastern Europeans and Asians and blacks and Slavs. And who's at the bottom of the barrel? The Jew, the, Jew, the subhuman. And Hitler, you know, all these you know, ridiculous devices. Jews obviously have smaller craniums. They're, they're dumber. They're physically weaker. But guys, the problem is we know there's no, the whole theory is, of course, pseudoscience, and there's no such thing as a Jewish race. We come in all size, shapes, and colors. You figure that out as soon as you visit Israel. So we put all this together, and we see that all of our supposed explanations for anti-Semitism just don't hold any water. None of them begin to explain this hatred. And not only that, none of them have, besides any basis in reality, really, none of them have anything to do with Judaism. You notice there's like nothing Jewish about hating Jews? What's the most famous diary from the Holocaust? Anne Frank. Now, we all know the Anne Frank. Anyone been to her house in Holland? It's like the Holocaust Memorial for Holland. It's, and her diary is probably the most widely read book on the Holocaust. Anne Frank was a German girl, not religious, traditional a little bit. Family fled from Germany when Hitler got to power, went to Holland. The Dutch, don't confuse them with the Danes. The Dutch love turning over Jews. The Danes sent all their Jews to Sweden. They didn't. But after hiding in this attic with her family, towards the end of the war, someone ratted on them, and she ended up in Bergen-Belsen, and she died of typhus a month before liberation. The only surviving member was her father, Otto, who found the diary and published it, and it became a runaway bestseller translated into who knows how many languages. Now, look at what Anne Frank writes at 12 years old. This is a girl with very limited Jewish up education and not particularly mature, yet she nails it. It's an amazing quote. She says, who knows, it might be our religion from which the world and all peoples learn good, and for that reason and that reason only do we now suffer. We can never become just Netherlanders or just English or representatives of any country for that matter. We will always remain Jews. Wow. She like nails it. Now, by the way, the diary of Anne Frank became a Broadway show. Anyone seen that show? There's no way that anyone who, making this a Broadway show is going to put this line in there. This is way too intense and Jewish. So you know how it appears in the Broadway show? Here's how it appears in the show. Well, one day it's one group, and the next day another. Like Hitler sitting in his headquarters, you know, in Berlin. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, und now it's time for der Juden to go. That's it, six million Jews died for no reason. Obviously something else has to be going on here. So let's switch gears now in the time we have left and look at what anti-Semitism is really about, beginning with the fact that it is very different from any other form of hatred. So to begin at the beginning, here is Dr. Bernard Lewis, Professor Emeritus, Near Eastern Studies, Princeton University, who's the world's greatest expert on Islam, but also an expert on anti-Semitism, and he wrote in his book, Semite and anti-Semite, he said, hatred of Jews has many parallels and yet is unique in its persistence and its extent, its potency and its virulence, its terrible final solution. Conventional prejudice and persecution can be very terrible, but they differ from anti-Semitism as does conventional from nuclear war. Which means the world is full of racist, bigots, and intolerant people, but there are aspects of anti-Semitism that set it apart. Specifically, he's focusing on the intensity. 
But let's begin by looking at the word. What does the dictionary definition of anti-Semitism? The word, guys, don't forget this. It's so important. The word was created by a German, a, a German Jew hater in the late 19th century. 1879, Wilhelm Marr created the word in his book that he wrote, which was entitled The Victory of Judaism Over Germandom. Wishing to make hatred of Jews sound less religious and more racial, in keeping with all that racial thinking that was coming around, he invents this new word. In every dictionary in the world, it has only one definition, prejudice or hostility towards Jews and Jews alone. If you hate an Arab, you are not an anti-Semite. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, for over a hundred years, it was the only form of racial or religious intolerance had its own word to describe it. What do I mean? If you hate a black person, what are you? A racist. If you hate an Asian, what are you? Only Jew hate has its own word? That should get us thinking there's something weird about this hatred. And there are a lot of things about anti-Semitism that set it apart. Beginning with Edward Flannery, Catholic priest who wrote this book, The Anguish of the Jews. He writes, as historian of anti-Semitism looks back over the millennia of horrors, he has recorded an inescapable conclusion emerges. Anti-Semitism is different because of its longevity and consistency. It is history's longest hatred. I could show you in the Bible where we have anti-Semitism. The oldest continuous hatred on the planet Earth. Number two that sets it apart is the universality. Unlike other forms of hatred, hatred of us, like Tom Lear's song, it's not linked to any uh, relationship we have specifically with any one nation or religion or people or race. Wherever we go, it follows. It's the most universal hatred in the world. Number three is the intensity. The dictionary definition of anti-Semitism might be prejudice or hostility towards Jews, but would that, would that that were all that it was? Imagine if the worst thing that ever happened to us was they made jokes about us and we couldn't get into a country club. Remember what Groucho Marx used to say? I wouldn't want to be the member of a country club that would have me as a member. But we know anti-Semitism is so much worse than that. It's a depressingly long list of the most intense hatred in the world. A persecution, expulsion, rape, pillage, beating, humiliation, punitive taxation, ghettoization, up to what's the worst thing you can do to a people you hate? Kill them. What do you call killing a nation? What's the word? Genocide. Sounds like an ancient word. It's not. You know who invented it? A Polish Jewish refugee in 1944, Dr. Rafael Lemkin. Fleeing from Poland to England during the war, he writes, there's a crime happening in Europe, there's no word to describe, and he invents this word genocide. Even that word had to be invented to describe the unique intensity of anti-Semitism. But the last thing it sets it apart is what we've been looking at until now. The confusion, the irrationality of it. I mean, think about it. Ask a white suprematist to put on a whiteboard. You never use a blackboard. Well, a couple, list what you don't like about black people. He'll give you 10, 12 stereotype horrible things black people supposedly do. But you ask a bunch of Jew haters to put on a whiteboard why they hate Jews, they'll fill up 15 whiteboards. I hate Jews because they're capitalist, communist, warlike, passive, different, the same, strong, weak, rich, poor, dominant, lazy, servile, aggressive. What's weird about the list? A, it never ends, and B, it contradicts itself. Professor Michael Curtis, who was at Rutgers when he said this years ago, he still has the best line. He says, anything and everything is a reason to hate the Jew. Whatever you hate, the Jew is that. We've been educating the world for years. It's supposedly an enlightened world, yet we're still accused of the same crazy, nefarious things that we were accused of thousands of years ago. Okay, maybe we don't, in the Western world, we're not accused of using Christian baby's blood to make matzah, but they accuse us in the Islamic world. We're accused of sending sharks into the uh, Red Sea to destroy Egyptian tourism and sending vultures to spy on Saudi Arabia. It, no more logical than anything thousands of years ago. So there's got to be something deeper going on. So in the few moments we have left, what I want to do now is go back into the topic and look at it from the Jewish perspective to understand all excuses aside, what from the Jewish perspective is truly the cause of anti-Semitism. We're not going to do this through Jewish sources. We're going to do it through the eyes of the greatest modern Jew hater, Adolf Hitler. Now we make a couple of mistakes, by the way, before we look at the quotes from Hitler. We make a number of mistakes with Hitler. One, we call him crazy. Now, by the way, Hitler may have been a little more neurotic than most of us, but you have to appreciate, as a historian, I'll tell you, it takes greatness to do great good or great evil in this world. To be a Roosevelt, to be an Abraham Lincoln, to be a Churchill on one hand, and to be a Stalin, a Mao Zedong, or a Hitler on the other, you know, whatever it is, you got to have tremendous drive and potential. Truly insane people end up in institutions. 
So Hitler is not crazy. Number two, we often don't take evil people seriously. We think they're jokers. I'll tell you the opposite is true. Evil people, who by the way we'll see don't think they're evil, are much more ideologically consistent than most good people I know. Because evil people live in places that don't have elections and don't have to worry about what people think and be popular. They tell you exactly what they think. If you don't like it, they kill you. People who are good or living in democracies have to say things to get elected, so they tend to change their tune. Hitler is incredibly ideologically consistent from the moment he comes to power in 1933 to the moment before he puts a bullet in his head in his bunker in April 1945. His thoughts about the Jews are clear all the way through and his actions are consistent. Now we're going to look at a series of quotes. This is not from what's Hitler's most famous book that everyone knows? Mein Kampf, Mein Struggle. That's a propaganda book. You don't believe those books. That's for the masses. All the stuff I'm going to show you is from three books. Hitler Speaks, Hitler's Apocalypse, and Hitler's Table Talk. Send me an email after, I'll give you the titles and the authors. These are basically the conversations Hitler has with his inner circle of Nazi close friends and allies where he can let it all, so to speak, hang out and show you what's really going on in his brain. And it's pretty unbelievable. He says, the struggle for world domination we fought entirely between us, between Germans and Jews, or else is facade and illusion. Behind England stands Israel, and behind France and behind the United States. Even when we have driven the Jew out of Germany, he remains our world enemy. Now, he's not talking about Israel the state. He means the Jews. And he doesn't think that Jews control the world. He's not one of those guys. But National Socialism, Nazism, is at war with liberal democratic countries, and Hitler appreciates the ideology that is the driving force behind liberal democracy comes from where? Judaism. And he is truly ideologically consistent. I'll give you a great example. 1944, the fall of 1944, the war is basically lost for Hitler. Stalingrad has fallen, the German army surrendered, the Soviet army is on the march. Hitler has a choice, take trains and send German soldiers to stop the advancing Soviet army, or forget that, let's use those trains to send 500,000 Jews from Hungary to their death in Auschwitz. What does he choose to do? Kill the last great Jewish community of Europe. Militarily, suicide. Intellectually, ideologically, totally consistent. Look what he goes on to say. Do you now appreciate the depth of our national socialist movement? Can there be anything greater and more all comprehending? Those who see in national socialism nothing more than a political movement know scarcely anything of it. It is more even than a religion. It is the will to create mankind anew. By the way, one thing I have to point out is a digression here. It's funny, when a very left-wing person wants to insult a very right-wing person for being too right-wing, what do they call them? Fascist or Nazis. Guys, we've got to be clear. Fascism and Nazism are left-wing socialist progressive movements. Okay, It's called National Socialism. I just had to get that in there. But anyway, what he's talking about, he's saying not, National Socialism is not just about politics. It's a will to create mankind anew. I'm changing how people look at reality. He's a visionary. He goes on to say, they refer to me as an uneducated barbarian. Yes, we are barbarians. We want to be barbarians. It is an honorable title to us. We shall rejuvenate this world. This world is near its end. He is saving the world. Look what he says. Providence has ordained that I should be the greatest liberator of humanity. I am freeing man from the restraints of an intelligence that has taken charge, from the dirty and degrading self-mortifications of a false vision called conscience and morality, and from the demands of a freedom and, and a personal independence which only a very few can bear. By the way, this is a really important point. Evil does not think it's evil. This is one of the things that Hollywood really messes up in our heads. Because evil in Hollywood is Voldemort and Harry Potter. Or it's Darth Vader and he's black and he's dark and his henchmen have deformed and they're orcs and they're Evil is just like you and I. Evil has dental appointments, you know, and carpool. And evil looks like you and I and evil always thinks it's doing good, by the way. Hitler is looking at himself like a messiah. And what is he saving the world from? Look what he says. This is an unbelievable quote. A burden. What's the burden? It's a false vision. The weight of morality on people's shoulders of having to conform to acting in a certain way. It's too much for people to handle. I'm going to liberate you from it. Look at this quote. It is unbelievable. The Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a blemish like circumcision. This is unbelievable. This, by the way, in my opinion, is the greatest backhanded compliment ever given to the Jewish people. It's a blemish 
on the, he says, it's, a, it's a scar on the soul like circumcision on the body. By the way, who first called circumcision a scar on the body and warred against circumcision? Where was the first religious ideological war in history? Hanukkah. The Greeks weren't trying to destroy Jews. They were trying to destroy Judaism. It's pagan, there was the pagan world's war against the only monotheistic faith. That's what Hitler's all about. The next quote, in my opinion, is the most important. It's not a quote from Hitler. It's the words of the Hitler Youth song. We are the joyous Hitler Youth. We don't need any Christian virtue. Our leader, meaning Hitler, is our savior. The pope and rabbi shall be gone. We want to be pagans once again. Boom. It's just right out there. We want to be free to do whatever they used to be able to do in the ancient world. We don't want this burden of morality. It's just an unbelievable quote. It has nothing to do with power and money and different. It's all about what the Jewish people stand for. And Hitler gets it. He says, in the natural order, the classes or people superimpose in one another in strata instead of living as neighbors. To this order, we shall return as soon as the sequela of liberalism has been removed. Now, to make this quote understandable, he says, nature is brutal, but nature is balanced. You guys ever watch a nature show? Like lions hunting? Lions don't hunt, by the way. Lionesses hunt, and the lions come eat after. When the lionesses do the hunting of a, of a herd of wildebeest, what do you think? They challenge the alpha male, 1,200 pounds of muscle that can run at 50 miles an hour for a duel. Who do they go after? They stay far away from him. Who do they go after? The baby, the old one. Come on, you hear about a criminal attacking an old lady or a little baby. You think psychopath. What, the lion's being a psychopath? The lion's being a lion. It's nature is brutal, but nature is balanced. This is natural. In the ancient world, you know, that, what, the Rome respected a country's borders? Come on, guys. If America behaved like the Roman Empire, how long would Canada be an independent country? About five minutes. Canadians have an amazingly good army. All eight soldiers are like unbelievable. But America spends more on its defense budget than the next 15 countries in the world combined. Hitler's saying, this is the way it used to be. The strong survived the weaker lunch. Little countries were gobbled up by the big ones. That's natural. Not to conquer is weakness. You take a lion raised in a safari park and let him loose in Africa, what happens to him? He's lunch. The world is functioning in an unnatural way, and it's the fault of the Jews. It's not a fault of Judaism. It's a fault of the Jews. Look what Hitler says. If only one country, for whatever reason, tolerates a Jewish family in it, that family will become the germ center for fresh sedition. He calls us bacteria. If one little Jewish boy survives without any Jewish education, with no synagogue and no Hebrew school, it's in his soul. Even if there had never been a synagogue or a Jewish school or the Old Testament, the Jewish spirit would still exist and exert its influence. It has been there from the beginning, and there is no Jew, not a single one, who does not personify it. Wow. Unbelievable. Hitler gets it. It's something within the Jewish personality, the soul of a Jew. I have a whole class just on this topic of Jewish drive as an innate trait of the Jewish people. But since Hitler recognizes that this Jewish impact on the world is not because of synagogues and rabbis and learning the Talmud, but it's internally within every Jew, even Jews who are not educated as Jews and haven't spent their lives in yeshiva, he comes to a very logical but evil conclusion that every Jew has to die, which explains why Hitler is so uncompromising in his desire to rid the entire planet Earth of the Jewish people. He goes on to say, the heaviest blow which ever struck humanity was Christianity. Bolshevism, which of course is communism, is Christianity's illegitimate child. Both are inventions of the Jew. Is that a true statement, by the way? Totally. Communism was invented by Moses Hess, who taught it to Karl Marx, a Jew teaching to another Jew, and they threw Engels and all. The whole history of communism and socialism is a who's who of Jews, including the whole Russian Revolution. Unbelievable. And of course, Christianity, totally. It's an offshoot in every respect, histor historically and theologically, of Judaism. But Hitler says to get rid of these illegitimate children, we just have to murder the Pope and burn down the churches. Hitler was virulently anti-Christian. He just never lived long enough. He hated the idea of turn the other cheek. I have a great quote from Hitler, by the way, talking about how would that Islam had conquered Germany. He said, Germans are so warlike with the jihadi idea of Islam, they would have been an unstoppable force in history. Can you imagine that? Jihadi Nazis, it's a scary thought. 
Anyway, it's an amazing that Hitler even nailed that, going back, very relevant to today. But he said to get, he, to get rid of Christianity, just burn down the churches. To get rid of communism, kill Stalin. But to get rid of the mother of the bastard children, you can't just kill the rabbis and burn down the synagogues. Every Jew is de hard, is basilicus, bacteria. He's going to reproduce and fill the world some way with some offshoot liberal Jewish idea that's going to infect the world. What's amazing is the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat says something that parallels this. Now, we become a nation in a very interesting circumstance. Every other people becomes a nation by living in a national homeland and eventually coalescing into a national identity. Where do we become a nation? Don't think of Brooklyn. Doesn't count. Sorry? Outside our homeland at Mount Sinai, not when we take pledge allegiance to statehood, we pledge allegiance to a certain ideology, values, a mission that comes from our relationship with God. We say, na'aseh v'nishma. We'll, we'll listen, we'll do it, and then we'll listen. We're going to do it. We're committed to being the God squad. So it's interesting, Sinai, where we become a nation, in Hebrew is Sinai, the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat says, don't read it as Sinai, read it as Sinah, which is the word for hatred. At Mount Sinai, anti-Semitism was born. The battle between our values, the values that come from relationship with God, and the pagan world's values, which at that time was everyone else in the world besides the Jewish people. As T.R. Glover, the historian, says, mankind, East and West, Christian and Muslim, accepted the Jewish conviction that there was only one God. Today it is polytheism that is so difficult to understand that is so unthinkable. So through a very difficult and long drawn out process, we've weaned a huge chunk of the world off polytheism and the values that come from that society into a worldview that's monotheistic. And the impact of that has been much greater than just in religion. John Adams, second president of the United States, writes, in spite of Bolingbroke and Voltaire, I will insist the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited this earth. The Romans and their empire are but a bubble in comparison to the Jews. They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any other nation, ancient or modern. And if he were running for president today, I would definitely vote for him. Look at what British historian Paul Johnson writes in his book. He says, certainly the world without the Jews would have been a radically different place. To them we owe the idea of equality before the law, both divine and human, of the sanctity of life and the dignity of human person, of individual conscience and so of personal redemption, of collective conscience and so of social responsibility, of peace as an abstract ideal and love as the foundation of justice, and many other items which constitute the basic moral furniture of the human mind. Without the Jews, it might have been a much emptier place. Pretty amazing quote. But he's, he said the basic moral furniture, value of life, peace, social responsibility, equal justice, these are all values that directly or indirectly have come from the Jewish people. The first book I wrote is even copies right there. World Perfect is all about the impact of monotheism in shaping the world's values today. A very little appreciated topic but one that Hitler definitely appreciated. Let me ask you guys, Hitler, seeing the quote of John Adams and Paul Johnson, would he agree or disagree with the impact of the Jews? He would totally agree. What's the difference, therefore, between Hitler on one hand and Paul Johnson and John Adams on the other? They all see the historically proven fact that the Jewish people, directly or indirectly, have been the greatest transformative force in values and religion in human history. Their difference is the reaction to it. Paul Johnson and John Adams are thinking, yeah, this is great. Hitler's saying, this is the worst thing that ever happened to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Adolf Hitler is not evil because of his understanding of the Jewish people. He understands what a Jew is better than 90% of the Jews in the world understand what a Jew is. He's evil because of his reaction to it. He says, I seize the power of the Jewish people, and that's what I hate. Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin wrote an amazing book, which coincidentally happens to be the same title of the seminar. Um, it came out at the same time, completely accidentally. There's no accidents, however, we know. It's all good timing. And in it, they sum this whole topic up beautifully. They say, from its earliest days, the raison d'etre, the reason for being of Judaism, has been to change the world for the better. This attempt to change the world, to challenge the gods, religious or secular, of societies around them, and to make moral demands upon others, has constantly been a source of tension between Jews and non-Jews. We now understand why so many non-Jews have regarded the mere existence of Jews, no matter how few, as terribly threatening. The mere existence of Jews with their different values and allegiances constituted a threat to the prevailing order. 
Simply put, this is a beautiful statement. We have been dragging the world kicking and screaming towards a vision of values and anti-Semitism is the reaction against that, the rebellion against that. Friedrich Nietzsche, and we're coming to the close here. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, he has a great line. He said, a human being can survive anyhow as long as he has a proper why, which means people will go through tremendous pain and even be put to death and do it willingly and gladly if they know what they're suffering or dying for is meaningful. And by the way, that's the story of the Jewish people. None of us would be sitting in this room today as Jews if we did not have ancestors who went through tremendous persecution and even gave their lives and died with the last thing coming out of their mouth being Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, knowing that they were giving their lives for ultimate meaning. And by the way, what is potentially <coughs> dangerous to the Jews, you know, to come to a conclusion, to put it all together, you know, when you do a topic like this, and, it's, and it can be very depressing and heavy, but the first thing to appreciate that as on a macro level, we don't have to be panicked and freaking out here. Yes, anti-Semitism is reaching all-time highs since the Holocaust, and it is scary. We can't be passive, we can't go to sleep, but we have to remember every year at Passover, we actually raise a cup at the Seder and we say, Amda. It's like L'chaim, you know? And every generation, they try and destroy us. Today, all the people who tried to kill us, where are they? In the Metropolitan Museum of Art up the street here, you know, you can visit what's left of them. On a macro level, look, the Jewish people, like we say, Am Yisrael Chai, we've outlasted everyone. But the real danger is on the micro level. What is potentially very problematic for Jews on individual level is to take a Jew, expose them to anti-Semitism, but expose a Jew to anti-Semitism who doesn't have the Jewish pride, doesn't have clarity about the mission, which, by the way, is the vast majority of Jews in America, especially in university campuses today. <laughs> you take a Jew who has no Jewish pride and expose them to anti-Semitism, what's the decision they're probably going to make? Assimilate. And that's a double disaster. First of all, that means you broke the chain. Everything that our ancestors did to get us here today was for nothing because you opted out of the Jewish people. And by the way, it doesn't work because one of the unique facets of anti-Semitism, which is kind of scary, is unlike other hatreds, where when you become more like the people, they hate you less until you disappear, the greatest explosions of anti-Semitism have always taken place where? in places where we are most like the non-Jews. No one was more German than German Jews. It's the way we're being told that we cannot be allowed to collectively disappear because our mission in history is just too important. So to end with a little analogy here. Imagine you're a new parent and you have a daughter with flaming red hair. Redheads are an endangered species, by the way. She goes off to school, preschool the first day, and she comes back totally distraught because everyone made fun of her hair. Mommy, everyone called me Carrot Top and Rudolph the Red-Headed Reindeer. Okay, this is PET, Parent Effectiveness Training now. What do you do? You give your daughter a big hug and a big kiss. You tell her she's special, she's beautiful, they're jealous. You got a great future as a stop sign. Anything positive. What is the one thing you're not going to tell your daughter? Change your hair. Dye your hair. The biggest mistake we could make would be to think that was something wrong with us and we have to change. As I said before, you break the chain, uh-uh, that's it. You've committed spiritual suicide. But again, the anti-Semitism doesn't go away. It only gets worse. So ladies and gentlemen, when dealing with the issue of why the Jews, the first question we have to deal with is, of course, why be Jewish? We have to instill in ourselves and our children and our grandchildren Jewish pride in our mission as a people Jewish identity and support for Israel. It's a package deal. It all goes together, by the way. Support for Israel and Jewish identity go together. Okay, we see that, what's going on. If you guys see the Pew Report, what's happening in America? The difference between Jewish identity and support for Israel of older people versus it's literally a fraction of the amount of people. And they send these people to university campuses where they get bombarded with all of the propaganda about what the horrible Jews in Israel are doing. It is disastrous. But as the real solution to anti-Semitism, the best way to close is with a line of Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, the great rabbi from the early 19th century. And this sums it up better than any other line. Sometimes the shortest lines are the best ones. He says, when Jews don't make Kiddush, Gentiles make Havdalah. When not Kiddush and Havdalah, y'all, you know what we're talking about? We're not talking about literally. But Kiddush is when we go on Friday night, the world goes from the six normal days to the higher spiritual elevated state. Havdalah is on Saturday night when the world goes down to its normal state. Guys, our job is to do Kiddush Hashem. We're the God Squad. We're supposed to fill the world with values. 
that come from our relationship with God. If we don't do that, like we say in physics, nature abhors a vacuum. The world will be full of one of two kinds of values. The values that we're supposed to put in the world, of peace, of justice, of social responsibility, of loving your neighbor, of taking care of the world, or the opposite values. And when the opposite values come into the world and those values are evil, they will target us first. Like Prager and Telushkin say in their book, the Jew is the canary in the coal mine. Remember they used to bring canaries into the mine because the canary is more susceptible to the gas than the miner is and the canary you know, purchase, falls over and dies, get out of the mine. When evil comes into this world, you can test this like gravity. Jews will be the first target if they're around in that country. It's an unbelievable thing. It's a rule you can see wherever we look. It begins with Jews, but it doesn't end with Jews. Hitler starts with the Jews, but he goes for a lot of other people. And just as the Jew within a country is the measure of how that country is doing in terms of democracy and human rights, George Gilder, in his book, The Israel Test, he sums it up beautifully. He says, Israel is the Jew amongst the nations. It's not an accident. The most dangerous rogue states in this world, like North Korea and Iran, hate Israel. Evil comes into the world. It's got its sights on us, the Jewish people. So if we understand this idea, guys, obviously we have to be proactive for the Jewish people. We have to commemorate the Holocaust and fight anti-Semitism and support Israel. We don't rely on miracles, but bottom line, if ultimately what drives anti-Semitism, all excuses aside, is this eternal struggle of, of, that began with Abraham 3,800 years ago of dragging the world towards these values, the only way we're ever going to end this phenomenon is to complete the job that Abraham started, to create a Jewish people that is a unified people, that is a proud people, that is an educated people, because you can't represent the Jewish people until you know what the Jewish people represents. Believe me, ignorance and not anti-Semitism is a greater threat to us today, and disunity. But if we had a Jewish people that is unified and educated and proud and using the amazing potential that we have as a nation collectively to achieve that mission, is there anything we couldn't accomplish in this world? And let's hope as we approach Rosh Hashanah, which is coming up very, very soon in just a few days, that we don't need the rest of the world to remind us through anti-Semitism to wake up and look at ourselves as Jews and act as Jews. Because we notice, by the way, that anti-Semites come, they never distinguish between whether we're Reform, conservative, orthodox, liberal, conservative, Zionist or not, live in Israel or not. We all go to Auschwitz together. We have to start looking at ourselves the same way. We're all part of one family. We have to start loving each other and working together. And hopefully this year we'll merit to do that, to work as a people and use that potential to bring not just Jewish values to the Jewish state, but to the whole world. And then we get the end to anti-Semitism and peace not just for the Middle East and for Israel, but for the whole world. And let's hope it happens soon in our days. And thank you very much and Shana Tova. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV on JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. <laughs>